this computer. Cool. Got my chat window over there. <clears throat> so we're gonna do a few things today. Um, specifically, we're getting into the uh, the topic related to basic web page layouts. And there's gonna be some stuff you're already familiar with because you've already been making web page layouts, but now it's our official topic. So which means I'm gonna show you a few new things and kind of show you new ways to use some of the things you've already been doing um, just to make sure they become habit. And before we get into that, uh, what is the difference between fixed, fluid, adaptive, and responsive layouts? And why should you care? This is one of your resources. And by the way, for our uh, week six topic, we're actually in week six now, um, there's a lot of resources. I'm playing around with this little time estimator thing and trying to put <clears throat> approximate times it'll take even for things that aren't videos. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of resources. Notice there's several resources just for inspiration, just so you can look at different layouts, but go through those. And the page that I'm looking at right now is one of those resources. It's a pretty quick read. Fixed layouts. Now, for the most part, everybody in class so far has been doing fixed layouts, and that's perfectly reasonable. That's what most beginners will do. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. I uh, get allergies, so I think we're approaching allergy season for me. Now, with a fixed layout, you can see what happens. And I know this has happened to a few people already. You know, if the browser is narrower, then it's either gonna cut off part of that page or you're gonna get a horizontal scroll at the bottom and stuff like that. But when you're first making web pages, fixed layouts are often one of the easiest ones to work with. So it's reasonable that we all start with those. A fluid layout is kind of what I wanna get us into today. I wanna make sure we're using fluid layouts. So as the browser gets smaller, many of our elements also get small, uh, smaller. This is not necessarily what you would do for mobile, but it's kind of there. So we want to transition and not use fixed layouts anymore. Not that you can't sometimes, but um, let's practice now using what are called fluid layouts. So instead of using fixed pixels for the big chunks, the big parts, we're probably going to end up using more percentages um, and things like that. Now, adaptive is one. <clears throat> I may have done adaptive designs many years ago, but not so much anymore. And you can see kind of from, from this visual is what adaptive is doing. It's actually serving up a different web page layout based on the width of the device. And at a glance, that can sound like a pretty good way to go but there's a better way under the fourth option, a little bit further down on this uh, article. So the problem with adaptive is you're making usually these key different layouts, and then you're probably using something like JavaScript in order to determine the device width or the viewport width, and then you will load up that particular page or style as appropriate. It works pretty well, but it's not as efficient as the fourth method, which is responsive. We're not getting into responsive today. That's coming up very, very soon. But responsive um, kind of takes the fluid layout, which I do want us to get into, and enhances it. So you notice with responsive, the sizes and the designs and the layout of the web page will, I don't want to say adapt because there's an adaptive, but they will respond to all of the different browser sizes possible, all of the different device sizes. So it allows for a much more, I don't even want to say fluid, but it allows for a more fluid kind of change from device to device. So ultimately, we want to get to making responsive layouts. And we'll do that in the weeks, in the couple of weeks following this week in week seven and eight. For now, we're going to focus on fluid layouts that will expand and contract basically with desktop sizes. Let's not worry about phones and tablets quite yet, but desktop sizes. So, I don't know, 12, 1300 pixels minimum up to uh, 2000 pixels, something like that. So we want a little bit of flex. And we're also gonna make sure that we don't get any horizontal scrolling. Cool. So, so far everyone good? I don't think I've actually heard from anybody yet in chat or on mic. So I'm assuming everyone can hear me and uh, 
can see my screen and stuff like that. <clears throat> and there's a couple folks that I'm definitely glad are here because one of the things I'd like us to practice leading up to our official layout practice is I want to make a drop down menu with you. And this is likely going to be an extra credit skill coming up. There's been a couple of st uh, students in this class. Uh, one has actually uh, enabled a pretty good little drop down menu on their index home. And I've had a couple of other students ask about it. So, and uh, I think it'll be a good extra credit activity. Now, the drop down menu I'm going to make here in a few minutes, and hopefully you'll make with me, won't be the actual extra credit assignment, but it'll be good prep for the extra credit assignment. Doing drop down menus and stuff like that is going to definitely be a necessity if you end up taking the Web Development 2 class uh, next year. But um, since there's been enough interest and I think the skill level is there, I'd like to tackle it here. And it's not that it's terribly complicated, but it can be very uh, finicky on what you do. So I'm going to make a little drop down menu for the first part of our class. The second part of our class is where I do want to take care of a participation activity, a little five point participation activity. So participation 6A, mimic the layouts. I give you this PDF file. I'm going to load mine up and uh, had fun making this in Microsoft Word. <clears throat> but this PDF file is basically three pages, 18 various web page layouts. And for our participation activity, we're going to make three of these web page layouts. I don't know which three yet. Um, I can let you help me decide on that one. Um, obviously, these top four are probably the easiest to do. That's okay, and that's probably good to do at least one of those four. They start to get a little bit more complicated as we go down and look at some of the other layouts, and then they're not all complete, you know, the bottom ones aren't all more the most difficult, but I was just running out of different ways to shape these boxes and stuff. So I might have uh, made some pretty wacky ones. So we just want to hit three of them. If we can get to four, fantastic. But for our participation activity, we only need to get to three. Now, when you do get to the second participation activity, you're going to pick three on your own in order to tackle. So, and it doesn't matter which ones, you know, you can do some easy ones, you can do some hard ones, you're just going to do different ones than what we did as a group for the first participation activity. So you're going to be going back and forth to this sheet several times, kind of figuring out, okay, how do I do this one? How do I do that one? You'll start to see similarities and stuff. So just know that once you figure out one, it's probably going to be quite easy to do two or three others that have a kind of similar structure. But we're going to get to that very, very soon. First is the drop down menu skill. So I still don't have a code editor open. What's going on? So let's get a code editor open here. And uh, what am I got going on? What page? Uh, where am I? I don't even know where I'm at. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I guess I'm fine wherever I'm at. So let me, I, I know I'm doing something I told you I didn't want you to do at the beginning of the term, but I'm going to do file save as, since I feel like I'm already a little bit under the gun here, it's 1023 AM, 1024 AM now. And in my head, I've got this list of things that I want us to try today. And uh, I'd rather speed up this part of the process. And I think all of you are pretty, you know, you're pretty solid now in typing up the basic web page. So let's see, what do I want to call this? How about good old creative? Participation 6A. .at. Am I spelling that right? Participation. Yeah, it looks good enough to me. Okay. Participation 6A. <clears throat> so the page I'm using was going to be a, a, something I was tinkering with over the weekend that uh, it sounded great in my head when I started it, but I thought, oh, wait, this is going to be more trouble than it's worth, I think. So I didn't know what to do next. So I figured I would just go away from the screen and think about it and figure out how to do something. Um, but it hasn't worked out for me yet. Okay, so let's see, I've got my new title in there. I've got everything set up. I don't know why I don't have the dot U or dash US. I've got some standard meta tags in there. I've got some favicon stuff. I'm gonna leave all of that on there. Now I've commented out some external style sheets, 
But I think what I'm going to do is pop in another external style sheet. So that way I don't need to use internal styles. Delete that, delete that. So then there's just the, the body of my page. So I'm going to go ahead and put in link href equals style slash um, participation 6a dot CSS. Okay. All right, I think that's pretty good. Um, step by step tag symbols, tag symbols, tag symbols. Give me another, uh, give me a little more clarification on that, Jeremy. You it's mean like- the little, uh, little mark that goes like with AT&T when you uh, Google it, it appears on the browser as a tag with it. It was an extra credit earlier. Absolutely, yeah. Um, do you know, do you have a video made to just like step by step real quick to do that? Got it. So there's a, there's a couple things I think you might be talking about. Um, let me just go to a web page real quick. And in fact, Blackboard's kind of an example. So you see these little icons I have up next to these tabs up here or next to these tabs. I'm using the edge browser. So the tabs are over on the left. Those little icons are called favicons. Is that what you're thinking of? Because if not, I think I know what you're talking about. Yes, that's what I was uh, talking about, the favicons. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, it is extra credit and um, that was that people worked on a little bit earlier. I don't think I have a video for it. However, this it's not really, for those that did it, and there's probably about six or, in fact, maybe most of the people in the class today, I think did that little favicon extra credit. Um, and I think they might attest um, that it was pretty easy once you do a little Googling on it. So although I don't have a video for it, it's quite easy. So you would just go to a browser tab, your favorite search engine of choice. Lately, I'm using DuckDuckGo, and I'll just type in create a favicon. Now, of course, part of the Add Extra Credit Challenge was that I didn't use the word favicon. I didn't want to just make it that easy for you to research. So I wanted you to research it and find it, and there you go. So there we go. The best favicon generator, completely free. So what you do basically is you make a little image, um, or it could be a big image, I suppose, and then you use these, this online tool to load up that image and it'll do the conversion for you to what you might need. And then it'll even, once you're done, it'll give you the chunk of markup, the chunk of code you need to put into your web page to make it all work. It'll give you some basic instruction, instruction on how to do that. <clears throat> So I'm sure there is, you know, there's a YouTube video on everything. So I don't have, I didn't create one myself. However, I'm sure you could find one out there. Otherwise, I would just do a Google search and look for a Favicon generator. All right. So let me go ahead and prep this external CSS and make sure I'm connected. I'm in a, a folder, I'm in a different folder than I typically would use. So I want to do a test early on. So that way I feel like I'm, I'm locked and loaded and ready to work on this particular page. So let's see, I'll just open up a new tab there, file, save as, and I'm going to go into my styles folder participation 6a.html. Cool. All right. Now, really quick, I'm going to go ahead and do a reset rule up here. Reset rules are important. Every style sheet you make from this day forward, maybe from last week forward, should have a reset rule. Always do a reset rule. And, ooh. <laughs> oh, thanks, William. Yeah, you're right. I missaved this file name. And in doing so, well, I got lucky. I didn't screw up my original page because I did save it into the styles folder, but I did not save it with the proper file name. Thanks for catching that. Yes, I have, not only have I made that mistake before, but I've, I've started making changes on a web page intending to do file save as, and I forget that I have auto save set on my uh, code editor. So I'm saving over a page that I didn't want to change yet. Uh, thanks for catching that early though because that would have been annoying once I realized it didn't work. So let's try this, file save as, I'm still in my styles folder, but let's give it that CSS extension. Perfect, now I get the color coding that's gonna help. And my reset rule is gonna be pretty generic, margin zero, padding zero, border zero, 
box sizing border box. There are other things we can put into a reset rule, but I think these first three are essential. And I really like box sizing because later on, when we tell a box to be exactly 80% or exactly 500 pixels or exactly 100%, we, won't, we don't want the thickness of the border to add to that width. And by putting box sizing border box, the thickness of the border will be incorporated into the width of the box which means we can be very precise with our numbers and know that it's not gonna be something different than what we said it's gonna be. Why do I put some things on the same line and others I do not? Okay, so there actually is a small amount of logic, probably not a ton of logic to this, but a small amount of logic. Now, when it comes to my reset rule, I put these on the same line just because I know that's all I'm gonna have and I don't want my reset rule to take up a lot of vertical space. So that's the basics for that. Then it gets to other things. So let's say, and of course body is not the best example here, but I will often put two declarations or maybe three on the same line if they are distinctly related to each other. You're gonna see this pretty soon. But for instance, if I do width of something, I often will put height in the same area or the same row, I mean. It just makes sense to me, width and height. And I usually do width first, just because that's the number I usually think of first. So width and height, I put them on the same row because they go hand in hand. The other thing you're gonna see me do a little bit later is position absolute. Now, whenever I position something absolute, I have to say, where am I gonna position it? Well, then I'll usually say something like top 10 pixels left, 50%, something like that. So when I do a position absolute or a position relative, I usually put the top and left or the bottom and left or bottom and right declarations on the same row. Again, they just go hand in hand. I'm not gonna be using top and left without using position. And if I'm using position absolute, I'm definitely gonna be using those measurements. So I put those in the same line or yeah, the same line. And then of course I divide up other things into separate lines just so I can quickly scan through and read them. There's no functional reason I'm doing that, by the way. If you like the look and the organization of having everything vertical with nothing, no two things on the same line, then that's the way you do it. Um, but of course I don't want to get carried away either. I don't want to start putting four or five or six declarations on the same line even if they're starting to get related, it gets a little bit tougher to read. Now, none of these declarations here are a really good match for my body. So I'm gonna do these again later on, but I'm gonna take them out for now. But what I do wanna put in the body is font family, Verdana, even though I can't, I don't have any fonts yet. And I'm also gonna do a background color of um, Sandy Brown. That should be enough for me to see. The background color should be sufficient for me to see my page. So I'm gonna jump over to my HTML file. I'm gonna click my little go live. Perfect, loads up. I can see that web page. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and put some content on this page. Now remember, this is gonna be a participation page or it's gonna lead into a participation page. But the first thing we're doing is this drop down menu effect, which is gonna be a future extra credit skill. Um, and of course, we're in the latter half of our term, so it shouldn't be too far away. But I do need to kind of do one here, just so we, a few people can see it, that look at the class recording and do this. And then when I serve up the actual extra credit assignment, you'll think, ah, okay, then you can come back and you can figure out what you did and go through the class recording. So it'll be a skill, that an optional skill for later, but still a good one. Okay, so in the body of my page, let's go ahead and create a, oh, actually, before I do that, this is another thing that's kind of a habit, although not essential. Div ID equals container. I like to use container divs for my web page, especially when they get bigger. Now, You'll notice that my opening div tag is right after the opening body tag, and my closing div tag is right at the end of the page before the closing body tag. 
And in many of our styles, in many of our web page layouts, this doesn't matter so much, but it's a habit I got into many years ago and I still like it because when I do want it, it's super helpful. If I don't want it, it doesn't hurt anything. So it is a pretty common thing that I'll do in a lot of web pages. So let's see, this is just gonna be the end of my parent container. The reason I like to use it is because it gives me something to structure that is not the body of the page. Although you could structure the body of the page too, and some web developers will do so. Now, what I mean by that, and I'm gonna, I'll give you a visual in just a moment here. But for instance, I can set the container to be a certain width in relation to the body of the page. So if a person is on a computer that's, let's say a big TV display, that's over 2000 pixels wide, I can set my container to have a max width of 1440 pixels. It won't be wider than 1440. And I can even take that container and I can horizontally center it right into the middle of their screen. And so it gives me something nice to control. And then it's also easy to adapt and make it respond to a smaller device like a, a 360 pixel wide phone. So you might not appreciate right away why I'm using the container, but I'll put in some colors here in just a moment so it makes a little bit more sense. So within my container, I'm also gonna have an H1 and we'll call this participation 6A. Fun with layouts. Well, it's not gonna be that much fun. How about uh, examples? of web page layouts. <clears throat> now, you'll notice that I'm not using a header tag today. And I'm actually not using it intentionally, not because the header tag is bad. It's but I think you've only seen me use header tags. And I want to just give an example where just because you saw me do it before, doesn't mean it's essential for your web page. In real life, I would use a header, but um, I'm going to style this H1 just the way I want it to be. And then right after that, I'm gonna create a nav. Within that nav, I'm gonna have an unordered list. Make that lowercase. And within that unordered list, I'm gonna create three list items. Each of these list items is gonna have an anchor tag in it. I'm gonna start off just with a dummy hyperlink. Whenever I want to create a fake hyperlink that doesn't work, but it pretends to work, I use href equals hashtag. And then in between that first hyperlink, I'll just put in uh, um, blank menu item. And I'm going to take this list item and I'm going to copy it both ways. I'm having you do three menu items because I want to make the middle one a drop down menu. And if I only had one menu item that was a drop down menu, it would still work. You would still get this, the basic skills down. It just wouldn't look as cool. So I figure we'll do three menu items. I don't know what I need the, the outer two to be, but the middle one is going to be sample layouts. Okay. And the way I envision this working is that when the user hovers over that middle menu button, all of the drop down choices for the sample layouts are going to appear. Okay, so that's kind of the plan of action that I've got. If we had three menu items and we wanted them all to have drop downs, well, then we could easily just copy over the syntax. Syntax is going to be the same. So we're going to do a drop down menu for one of our three menu options but it will be easy for you to expand that concept out. Sample layouts, cool. <clears throat> All right, I'm satisfied with that for now. So go ahead and take a moment to just kind of absorb my HTML. And I'm not done with this nav menu, certainly, because I need to make all the drop down menu choices, but I'm good for now. And I've got my div container. I've got my heading one with some text. Um, I've got the closing and opening and closing H1 tags. Notice I put span tags around some of this text. I want to do something different with that span text. I've got my nav with an unordered list, three list items, and within each list item, there's an anchor hyperlink. 
opening and closing anchor tags with some basically generic text in there. Then I finish my div container, closing body, closing HTML. Cool. That is most of our web page done for this uh, drop down menu effect. Okay, so if you were taking screen captures, you could uh, take, the, take that picture for now, and I'll come back and adapt that, uh, add to it here in just a moment. Okay, let's see, back up on the styles. I need to be over on my style sheet, of course. Now I've got font family Verdana, background color Sandy Brown. I like to style things in the order that they occur on my page. So after the body, I have my container, and then I have my heading one, and then I have the span within the heading one. So I'm gonna to go to here, hashtag container, and I'm gonna set a background color on this container. It's RGBA 255, comma, 255, comma, 255, comma, point seven. Okay. Well, I forgot that my code editor did this when I was just typing up the 255, 255, 255. I was going to ask you what color you would expect that to create. But of course, I get this little indicator. It's white. And by putting the 0.7 transparency on there, now one would be solid. So one would be solid white with RGBA. And if I get that one closer to zero, like 0.1 is very close to zero, it becomes not black, it becomes very, very transparent, so you can hardly see it. So don't confuse that. It's the level of transparency that we're seeing, not the actual color. Although by putting a transparent color on top of another color, it does make its own color in a way. Let me give you an example. I'll do 0.5. Actually, I'm lying to you. I'm going to start off with one. So my container is now going to have a background color of one. Um, which is solid white. I'm going to give it a width of 90% and a min height of 800 pixels. Then I'm going to give it a, um, nope, that's all I'm going to do for now. That should be enough for us to see something. Okay, so I've got my autosave going. Let's head over here. On our right, you can clearly see that container on top of my body of my page. The body of my page is sandy brown. My container is white. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to ease back on this width percentage just because I really want, want it to stand out. So now you can clearly see that white container is narrower than the body of my page. Now I'm going to take this one for my RGBA value and I'm going to dial it back a little bit. I'm going to go to like 0.7. So it's a little bit see-through. And now that white looks like it's changed to this creamy color. No, it's just white that we can see through and I can see the sandy brown color behind this semi-transparent white. So it kind of creates a new color using those RGBA values or HSLA values, by the way. Okay, quick question for you. Good quiz question. I want to take this container and I want to center it horizontally on my web page. I want the sandy brown to be equal on the left and the right. You don't know how wide my browser is. How do I center that container? You can tell me or type it in the chat. I'm going to take a pause and drink some Diet Coke. <clears throat> okay, so, and that's cool. Centering a block element is going to be one of the easier things you have to do. And I know a few people have already done this, and I think I've addressed it a couple times, but it's really going to stand out this time. I want to take this container that you can see here, and I want to center it horizontally on the body of my page. So I'm going to jump over to my CSS and I'm going to give this container a margin that's 
zero pixels, top and bottom, auto margins left and right. Now by giving this block element automatic margins on the left and the right, it's gonna center it horizontally. So now when I go back to my page, this container is centered within the space. There we go. That is the big trick. And this is basically centering a block element. Now it could be that I didn't describe what I was going for very well and that was causing a little bit of confusion. But at least now that you see it, you can see what I'm talking about. I wanna center this container horizontally in the space. Very common to do that, by the way. So it's another thing that's nice about having that container there that I can manipulate. Now, of course, if my width of my container was like 95% wide, it's still centered, just maybe the effect is a little bit lost because you don't realize it so much. I'm gonna dial it back to 70%. Even though in real life, I'm more inclined to use 95 or 98% even, um, yeah, sometimes it's nice just to be able to really see that centering on there. That's centering a block element. Now, after my container is my heading one, I'm gonna give this a similar background color, RGBA, 255, 255, 255, comma 0.7. So here's a question. I'm using the exact same color for my heading one that I'm using for my container. So how are you gonna see it? Well, that's what's great about these semi-transparent colors. If you put a transparent, semi-transparent color on a solid color, you get this new color. If you put a semi-transparent color on top of that semi-transparent color, again, you get a new color. So you're actually gonna be able to see it even though my H1 is a different, is the same color. You can just barely see it but it's basically putting a semi-transparent color over another semi-transparent color. I like it. Now let me go ahead and add to it a little bit. I'm gonna put padding, one M of padding on the top and bottom, two M's of padding on the left and right. Text align center, I'm gonna center the heading text. So now that heading text, horizontally centered. The vertical centering, the up and down centering is coming from the padding. Since I have equal padding on the top and the bottom of my heading one text, it looks like it's vertically centered and it is vertically centered. All right, pretty happy with that. Now I wanna style the span that's within my H1, H1 space span. Now for that one, I'm gonna do color transparent, which means I won't even be able to see that text anymore. And then text shadow, zero pixels, zero pixels, three pixels, and then something nice and dark, dark black, or dark gray, I mean. So now I get kind of that blurry display. I'm only seeing the shadow I'm not actually seeing the text, I'm only seeing the shadow of the text. So it's just one way to make some blurry text. You don't wanna do that very often though, by the way, you're gonna make people think they've all got glaucoma or something. Um, so, but if you wanna be you know, a little bit artsy, you can put in some uh, semi blurry text. And I can ease off on that blur, instead of the three pixels there, I could do two pixels of blur, which means it's gonna be a little bit sharper. Or you could go overboard and I could do like nine pixels of blur and it becomes so, it becomes, you know, too tough to read. So now if I change the color of this text to orange, you'll see the text again and it'll have that blurry shadow behind it. I have black on there. Yeah, it can look kind of neat too white look. Okay, so that's the basic idea. I'll change this out to yellow. Okay, yellow text with a gray shadow. Okay, so I'm just going through my page. You know, I had the, the body of the page, I had my div container, then I had my heading one with the span. I'm now at the nav. I want to start styling this navigation menu in a way so that I can see it. 
need to be on the CSS. Now, before I start doing a lot of stuff to an element, it's always nice to be able to visualize where that element is. And when I see a question here, is there a way to trigger the blur effect with a pop-up menu? Yes, there is. I would have to get a better understanding of what you're going for, but I'm so confident there is, that's why I'm saying yes. Um, and if we get to a point here in a few minutes, if you think, hey, Ralph, can you put a blur on that thing that just popped up or popped down in our example? Let me know and we'll see if we can't trigger what you're talking about. Now, the blur effect, by the way, there's a different property called filter. Um, and you can use a CSS filter property and there is a blur value that goes along with that. So it could mean that we're using the blur value on there. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it, William. That, and that's the, you know, we see so many cool things out on the web. It's hard to describe, like, what are they doing there? Um, so, and of course, whenever you'll see something a hundred times on the web over a week, and then when you want to show somebody what you're talking about, it's impossible to find. That always happens in my class. I'm like, oh, let me show you what I'm talking about here. And I can't find a page that's demonstrating that exact same thing. But um, definitely, if you do find a page that's doing something you think is kind of intriguing, you can uh, obviously send me the web address to the page, take a screen capture and let me know and say, hey, Ralph, they're doing this over here. What do you think's going on? And I'll let you know if it's easy to duplicate or difficult to duplicate. And if it's easy, how we might go about it. What are all of my web pages? Oh, this big list I have over here. Whenever I want to try something, and this is just from this term, by the way, too. Um, basically, whenever I want to create a new page to test something out, well, whenever I want to test something out, I create a new page for it. And I kid you not, I'm not just saying this because I want you to do it too. But yeah, this is all, this is just practice over here. I wanted to practice making a gradient on an arc. So I made a page and tested it out. And there we go. And I feel better about that skill. It's not necessarily stuff that I'm going to demonstrate in our class, although you could probably figure out a lot of it. It's not that it's too tough on here, but yeah, whenever I see something on the web that I think, hey, I want to try that, or if I have an idea, um, I make a page for it. Now, where this values you as a student is if you do the same thing, there's going to be a time that comes up, and it could be a year from now when you want to do something on a web page. You can say, wait a minute, I made a practice file for that particular skill, and you can go back to it. Navigation menus and web page layouts are really good reasons to have examples of those old files saved away somewhere so that you can go back and call them up and then adapt them, edit them, and stuff like that. Um, if you go to 95.dev, you'll see many of these pages published. I often will publish them up there. So, so go with 95.dev and you'll see, you'll see a, uh, quite a few of them on there and I'll probably publish more um, in the next week or two. Okay, now back to this nav. I wanna be able to visualize this nav. So often the first thing I do with an element so that I can see it is give it a border doesn't have to be really big, but I usually like to make it a color that's going to stand out to me. So then when I look, I can see, ah, there's that element right there. Cool. Now I might, obviously I'll probably end up getting rid of the border, but the border is nice because it lets me know the boundaries and where that element is on my web page. I'm going to leave that border on there for now. Now I want to style the unordered list within the border. Once again, Order, two picks, solid. This time I'll do blue. There we go. So I can see the blue bordered unordered list within the red bordered nav. And I can tell by their behaviors, both of these are block elements. They are both taking up as much width as they can. So I now know something a little bit more about unordered lists and nav tags. They're block elements. Okay. Now, and I guess while I'm here, list style none. Get rid of the bullets. Okay, no more bullets over there. 
and then nav list items border two pixels solid and green now i can see the list items and clearly list items are block elements because they're taking up the full width of the screen okay not bad still knowing this information is going to be helpful any guesses on how I can get these three list items side by side horizontally? And there's several good ways to do it. How can I get these three list items side by side? I asked you this question last week and we did get the correct answer, but um, you can give me that same answer or a different one. Three list items side by side. I know you guys know this answer. Yeah, inline block, that's one way to go. Um, that's a pretty good one, actually. <clears throat> so if I go to my list items and display inline block, that's all it really takes. There you go. They're side by side. I like that one quite a bit. Now, what if I wanted to center these? There's a couple ways you can go about it. Once you display something as display inline block, is it an inline element or is it a block element? Well, it's a little bit of both. Now, if you wanna center text within a block element, well, then I would do something like text align center. Now, notice I'm putting text align center on the unordered list. Well, if I put text align center on my heading one, it centers the text within the heading one. In theory, if I put text align center on the unordered list, it would center the list items inside. And there you go. It only works though, because I had display inline block, or if I did display inline, that would have worked as well. But I, I think inline block is a better way to go than just display inline. Now, Sean, I really like the display flex answer there too. And if nobody said anything, if uh, William didn't mention display inline block, I would have gone with display flex. But I think I'm going to stick with this one now because I really do dig it. And we'll do plenty of display flex uh, soon enough. So if I didn't do display inline block, I'm going to take it out real quick. They're back to vertical. Well, then I would do display flex on the unordered list on the parent. And that gets them side by side again, okay? Notice they're not centered anymore. If I wanna center these, uh, these items in a display flex, it's a little different technique, okay? If you're doing the display flex method today, then I would follow this up with a justify content center, and that'll center them, okay? So that's one method. I'm going to comment that out, but the method I'm going to use today is display inline block. It's not that one method is better than the other. They're really not. People that visit your website aren't going to look at the source code to figure out how you centered something. You want to create a style, a layout that looks good, looks the way you want it to look, and you understand the concepts behind it. Now, it could be you might do advanced stuff later on where one of these methods is a little bit more flexible. No pun intended there. But if I was going to make a more complicated website, there is reason that I might want to go the display flex method because it allows me to do some things a little bit more easily later. For instance, if I wanted this page to adapt to a phone, um, I should say respond to a phone, then the display flex is going to allow some stuff Actually, display inline block could work pretty well, too, for a phone layout. So, But there are some layouts that, uh, that are just better to do display flex when we want to make responsive web pages for phones and tablets. Okay, so I've got display inline block. Cool, I like it. And I've got um, text align center there, so everything should be nicely centered. All right, I feel good about that. I'm going to take these list items, and I'm going to add a little bit of margin to them. I'm going to do eight pixels of margin on all four sides. So whenever I do one unit of measurement, 
Yeah, yeah. So Jeremy's asking, is there a website that has the CSS and a note of what it does as a reference? Yeah, and in fact, I think I gave you one as a CSS reference back in week two or three. Um, so go back and check those weeks and you'll find them. But otherwise, here's what you would be looking for. If you did a Google search for CSS reference, you'll probably find what you're looking for. But if you did a Google search for CSS properties, do the word CSS properties, that can be pretty good. Yeah, the W3 schools has a pretty good reference. There's lots of them out there, by the way. Um, web developers will often write really big reference lists um, that's they're worth checking out. So if I was curious, I would just go to a search engine, CSS properties reference, do a search. And there you go, W3 schools has one. MDN, developer network, that's a pretty nice one. Um, I've never seen this one, the comprehensive CSS cheat sheet. There you go. So it looks like they've got a whole bunch of them on here. Some that I haven't used before. There's font size and if I click it, it looks like it takes me to a nice page where I can see some stuff in, in, uh, in use. Actually, it's a pretty nice looking resource. It looks very cleanly written. Looks uh, easy to read. Nice quick example. And uh, let's see, what did that do? That opened up a new page. Yeah, that looks like it could be a good one. All right. Cool, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna drag it into my web dev folder so I can check it out later. Yeah, it's a nice looking one. There's tons of them out there, by the way. Um, yeah, I would just pick one that you think looks pretty good and just kind of explore it a bit. You're often going to find things on these reference lists that are not easy to test out. You know, they just can't be tested out quickly. But there's box sizing, but maybe they'll give you some explanation for it. And there's other properties that only work in conjunction with another property. So for instance, all this stuff you see right here, column rule color, column rule style, column rule width, that's, I, I'm pretty sure that's gonna be with CSS grid um, or with columns. And uh, so you have to use those in conjunction with some other things. Yeah, pretty neat. <clears throat> okay, so we've got our menu side by side. Let's see, let's get do a little bit more work here. And I wanna make these anchor tags, these menu item buttons, nice and big and chunky. So let's head over to the markup. Nav li space a. The anchors within my list items within my nav. Hmm. Yeah, good follow-up question. So. It's tougher to find things that are grouped together. However, there is a great website. I'll just put it here, CSS Tricks. Look for the website, CSS Tricks, and they've got a couple of guides that will put together a bunch of stuff. So later on, I'm gonna show you a Flexbox guide from CSS Tricks that's pretty nicely organized in one page where they explain a whole bunch of stuff together. And I know MDN has some examples of the background properties uh, mixed together. So for my anchor tags, I'm gonna make them a little bit bigger by giving them a nice font size, 1.4 M's. Remember an M is my basic font size, one M. It's about the size of a capital letter M. So 1.4 is 40% bigger than the standard. Font size, 1.4 M. And I'll do a padding on here of eight pixels top and bottom, 12 pixels left and right. Now, you'll notice that I didn't get all the padding that I wanted on my anchor tags, and that's because anchor tags are an inline element. And inline elements don't appreciate or don't work well with some of these other things. So what I'm gonna do with my anchor tags, now in this example, I could do display block. That would actually work pretty well here. Um, inline block would also work, but just by putting display block, my anchor tags are much bigger and chunkier now. Let me exaggerate it a bit. I'll do 12 pixels, top and bottom, then 24 pixels left and right. So now there's gonna be even more space. There we go, a little bit bigger there. Okay, I'm satisfied with that. And I'm also gonna do text decoration none. 
Okay. So there I've got my little navigation menu with my three menu buttons side by side. They're nice, big, chunky buttons. Let's put a little hover effect on them. Nav list item A. Oops, I need to do colon hover on there. And I'll just change the background color. So now when I hover over these, I'll get that, that yellow background. Okay. Well, so far, this has just been the easy part of the drop down menu, and that's setting up the parent menu. What I'd like to get to next is actually making the drop down menu of choices. And I want to do at least six options because we're going to have three layouts for our participation 6A. And then you're going to do three additional layouts for your participation 6B. Now, if we can make an, a, a drop down menu with six items, you could easily add to it and make seven or eight or nine or more as you need to, if you want to. So let's go back. Here's my CSS so far. There's a couple things I am going to need to tweak on here once we get going, but uh, let's visit this nav menu. Now, I'm ready to start creating my sub menu. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my insertion point after the closing anchor tag of my second menu item, but before my closing list item tag. So I'm after the closing anchor, before the closing list item, and I'm on my menu item number two. My insertion point is right in there. I'm gonna press my enter key a few times, just so that you see I've got some space after the anchor, but still within that list item. And I'm gonna indent a little bit here, and I'm gonna create another unordered list. This unordered list is going to have a class equals submenu. And I'm going to get rid of that space down there. There we go. So basically, I have an unordered list within the list item of one of my parent list menus. It's weird to say. So an unordered list within an unordered list. Now within this unordered list, I'm gonna have a list item. And within that list item, I'm gonna have anchor, href equals, and then I'm just gonna put in pages that I intend to make going forward. I'll just say P6 for participation six, layout1.html. Okay, so I've got a menu item. And then what I'm gonna do next here is I'm gonna copy and paste this several times so that I have five additionals, a total of six of them. So I'm going to copy that and paste it. And then I'm just going to renumber these. Come on. Oh, losing my mouse. There we go. Two, three, four, five, and six. Six, five, four. Three, two, one. These web pages don't exist, but they will, at least a few of them, hopefully by the time we get to the end of our class. And then, of course, you'll work on a few more as, far to, as part of your participation 6B. But um, yeah, so that's pretty good. So we have a unordered list within the list item of the parent unordered list. And if you were taking screen captures, that would be a good spot right there because that shows the complete nav menu HTML. And I don't think there's anything we're going to need to tweak with the HTML in order to create our menu with a drop down menu. So I think that's all it takes right there. Any questions about how this HTML is structured? It can look confusing. Um, I understand that for sure. It is super important though that that unordered list be within the list item.
Okay, let's get it on. So how does this make my web page look, by the way? It's going to look pretty messy, I bet. There you go. So there's my uh, sample layouts menu. That looks pretty weird, huh? Weird and neat and in the same way. In fact, you might be thinking, hey, I kind of like the way that looks. You know, I got my first menu item. It's, it's on a row by itself. And I got my second menu item, and that leads to the little submenus beneath it. And then I've got my third blank menu item. So maybe you dig that look and maybe you're like, hey, that's good for me. I'm going to go with that one. So what I'm going to do first is go to my CSS and change a couple of things. So for nav list item, my list items are green and display inline block. And I think that's okay. But here's something I'd like to change. Hmm. Now let's get more specific with everything. Okay, so I'm going to change this out, my first nav list item rule, and I'm going to change it out to be nav child unordered list. That should be enough to do something. Let me think for, for, a, for a minute here. Nope, I'm going to do that again. Okay, so I'm going to do nav child unordered list child list list item i'm not going to go look at my page yet i'm going to do something similar down here nav child unordered list child list item i think that's okay and then i'm going to change this one out nav child unordered list child list item a colon hover so what I believe I've done here is I've changed my styling so that it should only be styling the main parent menu, the first three menu items. My little sub-menu with the six pages, that should not be styled here. Let's see. Okay, <clears throat> this is actually good. So you can see that my menu is horizontal again. I've got my first menu item, then I might got my second one, and I've got my third. Now you can still see those six options there. That's pretty cool. But I'm back to this horizontal display and that's what I was really going for there. So again, my HTML hasn't been altered and I'm pretty confident I won't have to mess with this HTML. It's all gonna be in the style sheets and this is where it does get confusing making these things. So I'm using this weird combination of child selectors, meaning the unordered list that's a direct child of my nav. There's only one unordered list that's doing that. My submenu unordered list is not a direct child of the nav. It's a grandchild, right, at best. Um, this unordered list right up here is a direct child of nav. The unordered list down here is like a great grandchild or something. So that's why I'm writing that CSS that way. Now, I could have, and this may have been smarter, I could have put a class on this unordered list. Class equals parent menu. Then I'd have a class equals submenu and a class equals parent menu. That's not a bad way to go. However, then I wouldn't have had the opportunity to use those child selectors. So you could do it that way too. Back over to the CSS. All right, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Now, here's where it's gonna to start to get pretty interesting. I'm gonna to go to my list items, okay? These are my parent list items, and I'm gonna write position relative. Now, this is getting pretty important, and this is actually gonna be taking us into a web page layout concept too. So even if you don't think you're going to do the extra credit with the drop-down menus, I still want you to start to get comfortable understanding position, position relative and position absolute. And there's a couple resource videos for you to check out in our uh, week six topic here. Position relative. This is going to do absolutely nothing that you're going to notice. My page is going to look just the way it looked before. Position relative doesn't work by itself. But if you go to something that's position relative, you could then put in something like top 100 pixels, and you're gonna take that element and push it down. It's now, everything is lower by 100 pixels. 
negative 100 pixels is going to push everything up. So if you put something with position relative, it allows you to nudge the element. If you want to go a little bit of space, then position relative is a good way to do it. But here's the catch. That's not why I'm using position relative today. There's another reason to use position relative. I'm going to go to my sub menu. And I guess I'm going to do it right here, just so it's a little bit more organized. Nav, actually, I'll just do unordered list dot sub menu. My sub menu, remember my sub menu is within my list item. My list item is position relative. My sub menu is going to be position absolute. Now, when I position absolutely, I'm going to position within a relatively positioned container. Okay. So position absolute within a relatively positioned parent, or I used the word container before, but I don't want you to get confused with the, the main parent container. Okay. So the list item is the parent of my submenu. The parent list item is position relative. The submenu unordered list is position absolute. Now, clearly I'm not going to be putting my position numbers on the same line here because I got that big comment. So I'll go right over here and check this out. I'm going to do, what do I want to do? I'm going to do top zero pixels and left zero pixels so that you can see this sub menu i'm going to give it a really obvious border border four pixels solid what color have i not used uh, i'll do orange i guess see if that stands out that may not stand out that much i'll do black okay so my sub menu is going to have this really noticeable black border on it there you go and don't worry about the text overlapping. What I want you to look at is the black border unordered list within the green bordered list item. Remember, it's my list item that has the green border. And you can see that the unordered list is positioned in the top left corner of the list item. Submenu is positioned in the top left corner of the list item. There it is. My submenu is position absolute in the top left corner, zero, zero of the list item that's position relative. Okay. Also allows you to position absolute child. There we go. Okay. So this, oh, that's not. Did I screw something up here? No, nope, that looks pretty good. Oh, I don't know, for some, it looked different a second ago when I looked at this, right? Did I? All right, yeah, who knows? Okay, so here's the deal. I don't want that submenu to be that far up to the top. I want it to be down lower. So instead of positioning from the top, I should be able to position it from the bottom. So what if I did bottom zero pixels, left zero pixels? Let's see what that does. Yeah, look at that. Now my menu is all the way down there. Okay, maybe that's not so good. Let's go back to the top, Put that back to where I want. But I want to move it down a little further. I want that submenu to be below the main list item. Any guesses on what I might do for that? You got it, Sean. Add pixels. And no question mark needed. You should have thrown an excla exclamation mark on there, right? Um, yeah, just add more pixels. Well, what if I start playing around with this number? Now, 
here's something that would make my would have made my life easier. I don't know how tall my list item is. For instance, my list item doesn't have a height on it. So it's not really a safe thing to look at. But if I go back to my list items and I say, you know what? These are going to be a width. I don't even need to set a width per se. Let's set a height though. If my list items were 60 pixels tall, that might not have much of an impact on here. Do they look any taller? No, they don't look taller. Let me prove to you that it's working though. I'll make them a 150 pixels tall. Now my list items are clearly very big, okay? So I'm gonna dial these back to, I actually, I thought 60 looked pretty good. So 60 pixels tall for my list items. Now that I know exactly how tall those list items are, it's gonna be much easier for me to position my, um, my sub menu. So what if I said I want it to be 60 pixels from the top? Refresh. Look at that. Now my sub menu is beneath the main menu item. Make sense? We're actually almost done with the hard stuff. Um, and if you found this to be pretty easy so far, congratulations. Now I'm going to have to do a little bit of fine tuning, but I'll show you that in just a moment because I'm just, all right, I can visualize that sub menu on there. I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, yeah. Now check this out. I'm going to go to my sub menu and I'm going to choose display none. Okay. So you've seen display flex a little bit. You've seen display block, display inline block. There's also display inline. Well, there's also display none. Display none gets rid of that element. Weird. Similar to display none, there's also visibility hidden. However, I rarely use visibility hidden. Visibility hidden will hide the element, keep the space, okay? So if I do visibility hidden, you can't see the element, but there's space allocated for it where you can't see it. And other elements on my page would be affected by it. So visibility hidden can cause some problems. Let me comment that out. And I'm gonna go back to display none. Display none gets rid of the element and it also takes away the space. So if I had other content on this page, it would fill up that space. And of course, if I had display block, we'd see that sub menu again because my unordered list is a block element by nature. So I can make it display block, I can make it display none, and it goes away. Pretty cool. So basically the way a sub menu works, a drop down menu is when I hover over something, I wanna change the display of the sub menu. Hovering triggers changing the display from none to block. Pretty easy to do. Okay, let's write it. Um, write it right here. Actually, I'll, I'll do it right after this one since it is going to be a separate rule. Is it? Yes, it is. Nav, child, unordered list, child, list item, colon, hover. I'm hovering over the list item. Space, ul.submenu. Okay, let's think about this for a moment. The unordered list that's a submenu so basically my class equals submenu that's within my list item, that's within the unordered list, that's within the nav, okay? Notice I'm hovering over the list item. When I hover over the list item, I want my submenu to display block. That's it, kind of. There's a couple more things we're gonna do, but this is a lot of it. Now, when I hover over that sample layouts in the middle, look at that. That menu pops up. When I go to the, my first or third menu items, I don't get anything. But there's my sub menu. Now, let's see what happens here. I want to go down to some of my page layouts. I'm going to move my mouse down a little bit. Look at that. I lose my sample layouts as soon as I start to mouse down. 
This always happens. The first few times you start to make submenus, this same thing is going to happen to you. The good news is, oh, look, I was able to catch that one though. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Interesting. Well, we want it to work all the time. I don't know why it's working for me. But there we go. I have to go, if I go fast, it'll work. So you just have to tell your web visitors, whenever you want to go to the next menu item, just go fast. Okay, so if I drag my mouse down fast, I can get to my sub menu. But if I go slow, it disappears on me. This is, good. This is weird, I, granted. Anybody have any guesses on why that's happening? Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so here's my menu item. Why does my sub menu go away when I mouse down slowly? That's it. <laughs> There's a small amount of space where the hover isn't active. And I know you're thinking, boy, Shines must have done this before because he's got all the answers. And he is doing pretty good at these answers here. Um, and I know he's done some fancy stuff on his web page, but you've all done fancy stuff on your web pages. But that's exactly right. Because remember, this whole trick works on me hovering over the list item. And if I'm not hovering over the list item, if I'm not over that green bordered list item, well, then I'm going to lose the display of my submenu. We're still doing good though. This happens. We just have to change the positioning of our submenu so that it's in a place where we're still hovering over the list item. I know that sounds weird. I'm going to stay zoomed in a lot like this. And part of the reason I'm having an issue, by the way, is my borders. Uh, remember, I've got like two and four pixel borders on several things, and my borders are part of the space of those objects. But here's how I'm going to fix this. I'm going to head back to my uh, CSS. And instead of positioning my submenu 60 pixels from the top, I'm going to go 56 pixels from the top. I'm kind of guessing at that number, but it's also kind of an educated guess. I picked 56 pixels because I know I have a four pixel thick border, and I'm thinking this might be the correct one. I could be wrong, but it's going to be close. Um, 56 pixels now. Let's go back here. I'm going to refresh. I'm going to stay zoomed in. Now notice that my black bordered submenu is overlapping my green bordered list item. I could be in pretty good shape here. So I'm going to mouse as slow as I can and see if my submenu disappears. Look at that. Oh, then it disappeared. Oh, you know, I wonder if it's because I'm going over this I've got this other weird menu. So let me zoom out for a moment and let's see if I can get to a, a, a more typical. Okay, that's what I wanted there. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was a little weird when one sub menu was overlapping another menu item. However, now I can go super slow and get that effect. That is the basics of the sub menu that displays when we hover over the parent list item. What's really the big trick to this? Well, the HTML is important. We want to make sure we structure our HTML just like this. The unordered list is within the list item of the parent menu. For the CSS, it's basically making sure that we have position relative on the parent list item. And then our submenu is positioned absolutely based on the list item boundaries. All this other stuff, you know, top positioning, that's all, that's all going to be affected by the height you have of your list items and stuff like that. So there's going to be different kind of controls. Um, now, obviously, I'm displaying this page and, and you can type what I'm typing and stuff like that. I'm not going to be publishing this, though, because you will have an extra credit assignment in a week or so where you be tasked with doing something like this. And I don't want to just have my page out there to make it too easy. Um, instead, I want you to go back and try it and stuff. So, so that's basically the gist. Now, 
there could be other things that we do to this menu that we want to, but they would really just be aesthetic changes and things like that. So the, the main functional part we've got taken care of. And now it's just a matter of, okay, well, yeah, I guess that's all right, Ralph, but the way that I don't like those borders touching each other, it doesn't look as good to me. Well, the only reason it's annoying is because we can see the borders. What if I didn't have a border on the list item? So what if my list items don't have a border at all? Well, now you can't really see it that well. In fact, while I'm here, let me get rid of the border, the blue border around my unordered list, and let's get rid of the border around the nav. And there we go, there's my menu. And now I don't see those borders touching each other. But what if I like the border? but I still don't want them to touch. Well, don't put the border on your unordered list. I'm sorry, don't put the border on your list item. What if you put the border on the anchor tag? So what if I find my anchor tags? Do I have them on here somewhere? Hmm, here we go. What if I put a border on here? Two pixels, solid green. So now I have borders on the anchor tags yeah, maybe that looks okay. Who knows? But I still, they're still too close together. Well, check this out. What if I go to my anchor tags that now have that border and I put some margin on the anchor tags? Remember, margin is outside of the border. My anchor tags have a border. I'll do eight pixels. Oh, that looks a little funky. Not exactly what I was expecting, but I think it's because I've got these, I've got the margin on my sub menu too. And I, didn't, I wasn't expecting that one. So I'll go to my, uh, I'd have to have a separate control for my sub menu. Or I could do it this way. That might screw things up, we'll see. Yeah, then it makes all my other menu items really small. So I'm actually going a little bit backwards and showing you some other things. So let me do this. I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole because we're already an hour into class. Um, so I'm going to take that margin out for a moment. And I'm just going to let you run with this, knowing that it's just a matter of adjusting the margins and the paddings of other elements. Putting borders around the anchors can give the illusion if I don't have the borders around the actual unordered list. So I can get rid of that, that border there. So I get rid of that four pixel border. That's going to allow me to change some other things. 58 pixels. Yeah, that works. And uh, even going slow. And then of course you could do, I could do margin bottom on just my sub menu list items. So that would work. So there's a few different things, but it's all aesthetics. There's no real difference in the function. So I think that's pretty good for our little sub menu trick. And what I do like to do here in our last uh, portion, our last half of class, is work on our actual participation 6A. Now, if you recall from way, way back at the beginning of class, participation 6A means we're going to be looking at this PDF file and we're going to tackle some layouts on here. We're going to do three of them. And I'm cool if you want to pick the three you want to do. Um, that'll be our participation activity. And then later on, in a couple of days, when you do participation 6B, you're going to do three more layouts. So you have at least six by the time we get to Friday. Um, so we're going to do our first three. And since we're a, a, a democracy here, I guess technically we're a republic, but um, which, what is the first layout you'd like to do? So obviously some of the easiest ones are on the first page of six. Get a little bit more complicated on the second page of six. Although this one's pretty easy here, the little two blocks side by side, that's pretty easy. And then um, a third page has uh, uh, six tricky ones on there. Maybe, maybe they're not so tricky. Maybe they're actually pretty easy. Page three, bottom left, right down here. Okay, so that was the first uh, guess or the first pick. 
And uh, yeah, sometimes being first is what it's all about. So, so page three, bottom left. Is that what you're talking about there, William, right there, the yellow and then the blue. And then on the right, we have green on the top, purple on the bottom. Cool. I like that one. I like it a lot. In fact, it's a combination of several different looks. For instance, if I go back up here, we've got this split design with a large blue on the left and the large green on the right. We're actually going to end up kind of making that in order to achieve this look down here. So when you're looking at a web page layout, I want you to try to break it down into a smaller number of blocks before you start. Because if you can break it down into fewer blocks, then you'll have a better idea of how to maybe structure that, um, structure that layout. So I'll give you a quick little example. If I look at this, this one here with the red just above and to the right, I see four blocks, four small blocks, and then one large block. Well, what if instead of that, what if you imagined it to be one block across the top and a bigger block across the bottom. One short block, one tall block. One short, one tall. Not terribly different than this one, right? One short block, one tall block. One short, one medium, one tall. One short, one tall. And if you can make that, then the follow-up step would be to divide up that top one into four. So it looks like, oh, that was um, all those small white spaces. That was just a result of me making, yeah. So whenever you see little white gaps in here, that was just me half-assing it. I'm trying to get my little shapes drag, drag around. So uh, if you like the spaces on there, that's an extra challenge. Use white borders though, that'll make it easier. But um, yeah, so don't worry too much about this. It's just my, uh, my, these are all shapes and word and trying to position them and lock them in. So even what seems like a complicated web page layout could really be based on a much simpler layout. And that's really the concept I'd like you to absorb. So we're going to tackle this one first. Okay, I need a web page. So let's head back over to the code. Now the page that I made here, participation 6a.html, is just the menu. It's not my actual web page. So let's see, I need to make a p6 layout1.html. File, save as, p6 layout1.html. p6 layout1.html. I don't need the HTML twice. Okay, so I have a new page p6layout1.html. I'm going to use the same CSS file, by the way. I'm going to give it a better title. Layout1. I guess we can be descriptive. Um, page 3, bottom left. Yeah, seems good enough to me. I'm going to copy that because I like that title. And I'm going to go down here to my heading 1 and paste. And I'll put the spans around this part. Now, participation 6a, layout number one. I've already got, of course, I don't need a nav menu here. You could try, you know, if you wanted to play around with putting a nav menu on all of these layout pages, you could. It might be a little bit more trouble than it's worth. So let me clean this all out. And in fact, I, I don't even know if I want a heading up there. I'm going to get rid of the heading. I changed my mind about that. I'm going to get rid of the div <laughs> container too. I'm going to start clean here, with, at least with this first one. I might end up putting container back, but I'll use a different name for it since I'm going to be using the same style sheet. So there's the body of my page. I'm going to use the same CSS. And um, okay, P6 layout one. Let me go back to my browser. There it is. Where's my page? Now, in theory, if I go to my menu and I click on my menu for layout one, I should go to my new web page. Cool. I know it worked because I see the blank orange, but I can also see in my address bar up on my browser that it worked. If that doesn't work for you, no worries. Just go ahead and open up your, your layout page so that you can see it. Now, I'm going to take 
my picture here. In fact, I'm going to take a picture of a picture. I'm going to grab that. And basically, I'm just using my image editor to take a picture of that so I can put it off to the side so I can glance at it easy enough. And then I can just bring it over onto the recorded screen when necessary. But that's the page layout I want to make here. I'm going to push that off to the side. There's my blank layout. Okay, so let's get to it. I'm going to head over to the HTML. And in the body of the page, I'm going to create a div ID equals container one. I didn't want to use the same generic container that I did before because I'm using the same style sheet for all of these. <laughs> now, using the same external style sheet is probably a little foolish on my part. It would probably make more sense to use internal styles since each of these pages is different. Um, but I am a little foolish apparently. So I'm gonna use the same style sheet for everything. However, I wanna to try to be organized. So I'm just gonna go down to the bottom of my style sheet, make a new section here. Styles for layout one. Now we don't have to be doing the same one by the way. Now obviously in class, you're probably gonna to wanna to do the same one as I am, um, but on your own, when you're doing participation 6B, you can pick whatever three you want. And maybe, you know, we do a couple of hard ones here and then you have a couple of easier ones later and stuff like that. You'll get the same credit. It's really just the seat time that I want, I want you to have. I want you to have some practice. Um, okay, so for layout number one, here's the first thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna style my container, my container one that is. And I wanna be able to visualize it really well so I'm going to give it a background color that is pink, just something different so it stands out. Pink is not one of the colors I'm gonna end up using, but in theory, my container should be covered up. This part is important though. My container's width is gonna be 100%, which by the way, 100% is the default width for a block. So since it's the default width, you might be asking, well, why are you writing it? I'm writing it just to clarify, just to make sure everybody understands that my container one is gonna be 100% wide, flexible. Remember, we're doing a fluid layout here. And, and its height is gonna be 100 VHs. 100 VH is 100% of the viewport height. Okay, well, we don't know if this is gonna work, but this is a good start. My container one is gonna be pink. It's gonna have 100% width and a height that's 100 viewport height. That was actually worked out pretty well. Cool, my page is filled with pink, so I'm feeling pretty good. If I didn't have this height on here, You wouldn't see the pink block because it would have collapsed on itself. It doesn't know how tall to be. <coughs> okay, but here's the other thing. If I did 100% instead of 100 VHs, you don't see that pink on there. 100% is not exactly the same as 100 VH or viewport height. I know that's weird, but basically 100 VH, 100% 100 of the viewport height is very specific. We all have a browser, we all have a viewport, and all of our viewports have width, VW, and height, VH. However, when I use 100%, that means 100% of the body, and if the body of our page doesn't have any content, the body of the page is really collapsed on itself. You can't see that at the moment because the body doesn't have a border, but if it did, you would. So I do want you to distinguish between 100 VH and 100%. <clears throat> so now our container fills the space. Coolio. Now I need a large block for the left and a large block for the right. Two blocks, one on the left, one on the right. So 
So I headed back to my HTML. And I'll say div class equals left. Div class equals right. Okay. I'm going to div on the left and a div on the right. And they're within my container one. If I don't want to use div, I could have used section. I'll still use div anyway. Nothing wrong with a good div. Okay, div on the left, div on the right within container one. Container one space left. I'll do div dot left, just so we remember. <clears throat> div is class equals left. And let's see, again, my colors don't matter too much here, but I'm gonna do a background color that is, uh, I don't want to, I want to use a color that's not on here because I'm still, I am not making the, the yellow and the blue. I'm making the container for the yellow and the blue. And I'm not gonna make the green and the purple yet. I'm making the container for the green and the purple. Okay, so I'll do background color Generic gray. I'm going to set the width to be 50% and the height to be 100 VHs. Technically, ooh, now I can do 100%. I'll show you why in just a moment. All right, so I've got that one. And then I'm also going to have container one div.write. Background color, yeah. Um, 789, that's fine, just so it's different. You'll see it. With the 50%, height of 100%. Oops. Oh, it's kind of working. I can see the, the, I can see my left block, but my right block is all the way down here. I know it looks weird, like I've got a four block. It's just, it's just an illusion. You have to trust me on this for now. But these two gray blocks are the one I want to create. I've got two gray blocks. They're block elements. They're one on top of the other, which means I need to get them side by side. And of course, there's a couple of ways we can do that. But I want to go back to um, Sean's recommendation from earlier, display flex. So I'm going to go to my container one and make it display flex. Container one is the parent for my left and right divs. And now they're left and right. Notice I don't have any vertical scrolling and I also don't have any horizontal scrolling. Even if my web browser was smaller, I still don't have any vertical or horizontal scrolling. Cool. Now, by the way, vertical scrolling is not bad. Vertical scrolling is usually unavoidable because pages are almost always taller than the viewport. However, for this particular participation and going forward, we want to avoid horizontal scrolling at the bottom like it's the plague. You never want horizontal scrolling. And if you get it, that means there's something that needs to be fixed. But so far, we're doing pretty good. We've got our two blocks, one on the left, one on the right. If you were making one of those other web page layouts, this is how you would do it. But we're not making those other layouts. Technically, I could. I could do a file, save as, and make it and be done with it right here. But I'll let you do that later. So if you were curious about making the two, the split screen, two side by side, well, you're at that point. You would just do a file, save as, and then we could work on layout number two. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm not going to do that, though. I'm just going to do this one here, and then let's break it up. Now, the block on the left has a couple of inner blocks. I'll do a section. And I'll be pretty vague with my names here. Uh, class equals yellow. And then I'll do another one. Class equals blue. And then the second parent block is going to have section class equals green. Oops, didn't need to do that space there. 
by the way, here's a quick way you can write it in VS Code, section dot purple, enter. That does it too, fast way. Okay. Section class equals purple. Perfect. So that takes care of the HTML side of things for this layout. Now I just have to work on getting these colorful blocks positioned and sized and shaped uh, where they need to be. And of course, background colors that are similar. All right. Feeling pretty good about that. There's my picture. It's back off to the side. There's the HTML for it. Feeling pretty good about it. Back over to the CSS. Container one, section dot yellow. All right, background color. And I'll just type yellow. There we go. Background color is yellow and its width is 50%. Container one, section dot blue. Background color of blue, and its width is 50%. Now you might be wondering, but wait a minute, Ralph. Yellow and blue are like 25% width, not 50% width. But remember, they are inside of their own parent. Their parent is half of my screen. So yellow is half of its parent. Blue is half of its parent. So that's why I'm using 50% and 50%. And we know from before, if we want to get block elements side by side, well, then we have to go to their parent, which in this case is left, and we need to put display flex on the parent. Okay. And then I might need to put a height on yellow and blue. Pretty sure I will. So let's make sure I get that. It may not be completely set here, but let's go ahead and uh, jump back over there. Make sure I called these what I thought I did. Looks good. Okay, so let me go ahead and set a height. I was kind of surprised to see the blue show up there. But let's see what happens. Um, I'll do a min width or min height, I mean. 100%, min height 100%, and let's see how that's looking. Well, still not what I would have expected. I'm not seeing my yellow show up. So let me look back and see if I've screwed something up here. Anybody notice a typo that I might have? Let's see, I've got display flex on my div on the left. Hmm. I'm wondering if it's a height issue. Let me change this out real quick to 100 VH. 100 VH. Oh, I see my mistake. You guys should be all over me on this one. I misspelled the word container over here. There we go. Okay, so now I can see my yellow and blue blocks. By the way, if you're doing these layouts on your own, you don't have to match my colors exactly. You don't have to <coughs> match them at all. Just do different colors so that you can clearly see those different parts. Okay, in fact, maybe I should have done orange. So, all right, so now I've got those two. Obviously, typos are gonna keep things from working, so just be careful. Go slow and kind of look at your stuff and see if you got any typos and things. All right, now for the green and the purple. Container one, section dot green. Background color green. And height of 50%, I think will work. Container one, section dot purple. Background color purple, height 50%. Okay, I think this will be pretty good. Now I'm not seeing my purple show up, so I must have done another typo. Let's look. First, what did I call this? Class equals purple, P-U-R-P-L-E, that looks good. Container one, P-1, 
P-U-R, P-L-E. Background color is spelled, height is spelled. All right, I must be getting a little punchy or something. Um, I just, I think I went too fast. I should have just hit refresh to make sure, but I was paranoid. Okay, so there's our layout. Now, my, my web page is smaller than the page width. Notice I can move my web browser around and I can see these different widths. So if my web page is narrow, I still have that same basic layout. My web page is short, I still have that same basic layout. And that is what I want you to get into being able to do here. So that is that layout. And it's, I don't want to call it responsive because there's a little bit more to responsive than what we have here. Because if we were on a really narrow device like a phone, this may not be the best. However, it's a fluid layout for sure because I'm using more percentages. So I know I did that kind of fast, but, and I'm not sure if I'll have time to get to all three layouts here, but do you have any questions about how I structured the HTML? And then the basics behind the CSS. I'll jump over to the CSS in just a moment, but this was a kind of a trickier one. Key thing that I want you to take away is that I broke down this complicated four block layout into two blocks. Big block on the left, big block on the right. And that, that, I focused my attention on just that. Once that layout was done, I divided the left into two and divided the right in the two. And of course, a big help with doing any of this was taking the parent blocks where necessary and making them display flex. Remember, display flex will allow the children to be side by side. Okay. Um, otherwise, I used combinations of width and height sometimes VHs, sometimes just percentages in order to get what we wanted. Notice for green and purple, I didn't have to set the width because I wanted them to be as wide as their parent. So no need to set the width. If I did want to set the width, then I could have used 100%. Neat. All right, let's, um, we definitely have time for another one though. So let's, um, where is my PDF file? I need to be here. And there. Okay. Any other ideas here? Let's look at, um, so once again, we got the easy ones here. You could probably knock these out in a couple of seconds. <laughs> so that's the first six. Let's maximize my page. Um, there's the middle six. Of course, you saw how to do this two by two one here, or one by one, I guess. Any takers? Bottom right, interesting. I'm glad you picked that one actually because um, I definitely want to make sure we practice more with position, okay? So although I might not, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Definitely we'll be able to get this done. And once we see how position works, then I think you're going to have all the skills you need. Okay. So bottom right on the current page here. So it's this pretty funky looking one, right? Whenever you see the white there, just assume that's blank, no space or no block or whatever. Let me take a little screen capture of this. So that way I can just reference that image and put it off to the side. All right, back over to the HTML. Now I'm gonna to go to my layout one. I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. I'm gonna do file, save as, and this is gonna be layout number two. Okay, layout number two is page three, bottom right. All right, I'm gonna get rid of most of this stuff. I'm gonna leave the container, but I'll call it container two. 
All right, so this is P6 layout2.html, participation six, layout two, container two, back to my CSS. I'm gonna copy my little comments. Paste styles for layout two. Now, kind of like I did before with my container one, I really do want to make sure that its height is filling up the space. I don't think I'm going to need display flex on this one. I'll show you why in just a moment. But this is going to be a different kind of layout structure. I'm going to be using a lot of position. And I'll warn you of this later, but whenever you see position being used, you're going to think it's the holy grail and it's, hey, it's the best way to make all web pages. But it can run into some trouble. Bottom right on the curve, is it comments? No. Um, so the comments will not keep things from spilling over. I'm using the comments just for visual break. So that way, if you know, I want to go back to the CSS, I can find it. However, here's what I'm going to do to make sure that my CSS doesn't spill over because I'm going to be using class yellow, class blue again. I'm going to be using those again. However, I'm going to make sure I referenced container two as the parent. So you'll notice in my first layout, I referenced container one a lot, which means on my web page, those styles aren't going to apply because I'm going to be working within container two. So that's the real trick to using one CSS for multiple things that are named very, very similar, similarly. Um, so notice I've got div container two or ID container two on my layout two page. So I'm going to go to my container two and I'm going to make sure that it has a min height of 100 VHs just so that you can see that it's working. Good old background color pink. I'll change that to white when I'm done but I want you to see that pink background color. So I'm going to head over here. I'm going to just change my my web address up there to layout number two. So there we go, solid pink. So we know that container two is working. So container two has a min height of 100 viewport heights and a background color of pink. Okay, I can see this one has one, two, three, four blocks in it, all right? I don't have to worry about parent blocks with this layout. This layout is quite different, quite unusual compared to the others. So I'm gonna head over to my HTML and I'm going to do div dot yellow. There's my yellow div. Div dot green. There's my green one. By the way, it doesn't even matter the order that I'm doing these. Div dot purple. And div dot blue. Oops, that one, I, I, I typed it wrong there. There we go. Okay, so I've got those four divs, yellow, green, purple, blue. The order that I do them is unimportant because I'm going to be positioning all of these absolutely um, in the space. Now, back over to my CSS. I mentioned earlier with our drop-down menu that when we position absolute, it's best to put them within a positioned container. So the container two is going to be position relative. Okay, now I'll be able to go to uh, div dot yellow. I can position absolute and I'm going to position it zero pixels from the top and zero pixels from the left. And so that we can see it, I'm going to give it a width of 200 pixels and a height of 200 pixels and a background color of yellow. It's pretty much all it takes. And there's that yellow block. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. 300 by 300. Okay, so that yellow block is positioned in the top left corner of the parent space. In this case, it's my container two div. Now, of course, accidentally, I put a little gap 
you know, it's, there's a little bit of white gap around that uh, yellow block. Well, maybe that was intentional. Maybe I meant that gap to be there. Well, instead of positioning zero from the top and zero from the left, I can do four pixels from the top and four pixels from the left. And now there's a little gap of space around that yellow block. That's how easy it is to use position. Um, I'm going to show you a couple. Yeah, let's try something else here. Div dot green position absolute top four pixels right four pixels width green one is noticeably smaller 150 pixels height 150 pixels background color green all right can you see it is it up there Oh, I can't see it. I must have screwed up. Let's make sure I need to, ref oh, there it is. I had to refresh again. Okay, so now I've got the yellow block on the far left. I've got the green block on the top right. Yeah, that's basically what's going on. I'm saving the hardest for last, by the way. Come on, let's get to the markup. Oh, let's do this. You notice that I'm repeating a few things, right? Well, at least I'm repeating position absolute. So check this out. I can write this. Div.yellow, comma, div.green, comma, div.purple, comma, div.blue. All four of these elements are going to be position absolute. Now, since all four of them are going to be positioned absolute, I don't have to write position absolute for each individual block, since I've taken care of that right up there. And everything is still gonna be copacetic on that menu, or on that page, I don't know what I'm saying, menu. Okay, let's do another easy one. Div.purple. Now, even if you're not working on a web page right now, if you were working on a page, I'd say work ahead of me, because you have a good idea of what you're gonna type for this purple block, okay? Just as a reminder, there's the purple block. Lower left corner, similar technique as we did for yellow and green, but with slight deviation. I bet you can figure it out. And if you're not working on a page right now, think in your head what I'm gonna write before I write it. Especially if I use a guide like what I have with my green block. Well, let's see. Well, the purple block is not from the top. It's from the bottom. And it's not from the right, it's from the left. And its width, to me, it looks about the same size as the green block. So 150 pixels, height 150 pixels. And of course, background color, purple. And refresh, there it is. Now there's that little purple block down there. Okay, so we've taken care of three of the four colorful blocks on here. Last but not least is gonna be this larger blue block in the middle. And this one's gonna be a little bit tougher because it is horizontally centered and vertically centered within the space. So let's see. I'll do the easy part first and then you can fill in with the tough part. Div.blue. Uh, well, I'll do the width. The width is going to be four, 450 pixels and the height is going to be 350 pixels. I'll put those on the same line. Background color. Is blue. Cool. I can handle that. Now what about its positioning? What would you guess I would use for positioning this blue block? And I'm kind of picking on you here just because you're gonna, I bet at least one or two of you are gonna tell me the right answer. And at a glance, the right answer is gonna seem wrong, but I bet it's gonna be the right answer anyway.
how will I position this blue block in the middle? Oh, oh, I forgot about that answer, Jeremy. You're right. Margin is an option and margin would potentially work. But let me throw this out. Actually, I I'm glad you said that because it's not what I was going for, but it would kind of work. Let's see. Margin. Do we want any top and bottom margin? Well, I think I know what you're going for. You want margin left of auto and margin right of auto. And in a way, come on, refresh. Hey, that didn't work like I was hoping it would work. It should have worked. I must have typed something wrong. Let's see, M-A-R-G-I-N left auto, M-A-R-G-I-N right auto. Oh, you know what? I think because I have a uh, position absolute on blue. So if I didn't have blue up there, I'll just mistype it intentionally. Then margin auto, margin left and right auto does give me the horizontal centering. All right, Jeremy, you got me on that one. But what would you do for the vertical centering, the uh, top, and top and bottom centering? And let me go ahead and, ooh, padding. Nope, padding definitely won't work. And just so you know, uh, margin top auto, margin bottom auto is also not going to work. So the auto margin only works for the left and the right for centering horizontally. So margin top and bottom, we can't rely on. Padding, we cannot rely on. So actually this could potentially work. However, the thing you don't know, of, well actually you kind of do know about it in a way, it would be position relative. And then how far from the top do I wanna be? How far from the top do I wanna be? 100 pixels from the top? Close, not quite. 300 pixels from the top? Actually, it looks pretty good, but it only looks good on my browser. How does it look on your browser? How does it look on someone's browser that has a smaller device? So we can't rely on positioning a specific number of pixels from the top. So if I can't rely on positioning a specific number of pixels from the top, what does that leave me? Can't use auto. Yeah, auto only works for that margin left and margin right. VHs has some potentials. Oh, some potentials. I don't know why I'm talking that way. It has some potential. Um, VH I like. Probably not the number I was going to go for. However, I think it would work. So um, what kind of VH? What number or what percentage of the viewport height would you suggest? 50, perfect. 50 VHs, which is very equivalent, by the way, to 50%. In my head, I was thinking 50%, but I think 50 VHs might just work. And trust me, it is working. When you position something like this, it's being positioned based on the top edge. So the top edge is 50% down or 50 viewport heights down. 50% of the viewport height. So that part is good. However, when we position this particular blue block, we want to shift it upward half the height of the block. That's the thing you don't know about yet. So I won't, I won't keep throwing these questions at you that you can't even really guess at. But this one we would follow up with transform translate tra trans late y negative 50 percent i know this is weird i don't think you've seen me do this one in class yet you've seen transforms uh, rotate i know i've done that in class but you haven't seen this one translate y is going to move this block this blue block upward negative 50 percent however the negative 50 percent here applies to the height of the blue block whereas 
This 50%, I know it's 50 VHs, but I'm just saying 50%. That 50% is based on the height of the parent container. This combination of positioning from the top and transform translate is going to give me that vertical centering of the blue block. Yeah, I will. Um, so we're using a couple of techniques. I, I meant for us to do position absolute top 50% left 50% to get the same basic look. But I'm going to leave this in because I like that suggestion of using margin. So again, margin left and right auto horizontally centers a block. Okay, so we've got horizontal centering of a block with our margin left, margin right auto. Position relative top 50 VHs is nudging the block down 50% of the parent. Eh, hopefully I'm writing that clear. Transform translate X is nudging the block upward 50% of the block height. That's crazy. I know. It's just so weird. And this is stuff that I did not learn about these techniques. Actually, these most many of these techniques weren't around when I first started making web pages. But I didn't learn about these techniques in the first 10 years of making web pages. You know, it's only been in the last eight to 10 years. So they come up with new techniques for doing things. And I'll tell you, back in the day, centering an element vertically in the space was a pain in the ass. There was no good way to do it. And now there are like three or four good, easy ways to center something within the space. And um, I'll tell you, the way we used to do it back in the late 90s, early 2000s, you'd, we'd create a table cell. I'll tell you about that later on in the term when we do some stuff with tables. And so you'd have to pretend there was one big table cell and then there was a vertical align property that you could use to kind of to center vertically. It was a pain in the ass. It required so much more technique. So even though what I'm showing you here is really foreign, really unusual, and maybe complicated, I promise you it's really the easiest way to go. And there's a couple of other easy ways too. So if I didn't use margin left and right auto, I would have used position absolute, kind of like what I had up here before. Remember, I intentionally, in fact, I'll take that out since it's not doing anything for me. I would have used position absolute, and I would have positioned it 50% from the top, 50% from the left, or I may have used VHs and VWs. That may have worked okay as well. And then I would have done a transform translate Y to move it upward and a transform translate X to move it over. And that would have ended up with the same basic look and also the same number of lines. So it's not like this method is longer or shorter than the method I was gonna show you. So, but I, I do like it when you guys contribute the ideas because it, it just goes to illustrate that there are usually two or three good ways to do pretty much everything. And if you don't feel like you're doing something the right way, don't worry about it. You're doing it a correct way if it's getting the look you want it to have. So um, basically, the last thing I just want to demonstrate with this particular layout is that it's still fluid, okay? Now, notice I can resize this a little bit you know, on a desktop and everything stays where it needs to. My yellow, purple, and green box are still in their corners, whether it's very wide, in fact, off the screen, or if it's very narrow, they're still there. And the blue block stays centered. It stays centered horizontally and vertically no matter where I'm at. You will notice though, it doesn't take long before when I start to position something that there's a risk that the content will overlap other content. And that's a problem. It can be a problem because if I'm overlapping content, that means my visitor can't get to the content. So this is why position can be good, but it can also be over relied on and it can cause you problems when you're working on pages that are displayed in browsers different than yours. Now for this participation and for this week, I don't care about that. We're just focused on different sizes of desktops, okay? I don't care about tablets, and I don't care about phones right now. But that's pretty darn good. 
Um, and just because I think there might be a quiz question on it, let me point out that if I wanted the blue to go behind Z index negative one, oops, I didn't do what I was hoping. I mistyped something. Nope, I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing is what I, yeah. Hmm. All right, I'll have to show you that one later. I think you'll see a resource to read about it, read about Z-index, but I, I need to be doing something a little different to demonstrate that. If I did my original position plan, then we would have been able to see it, but um, that's okay. Z-index though allows you to control the layering of multiple positioned objects so that one was on the top before, is on the bottom the next time. Huh. Now I'm curious. All right, let me try this real quick. Let me go to yellow. Which does have a z, which does have a position absolute. And let me try a z index on here of like three or two. Ah, there we go. Now yellow is on top of the blue. So with z index, the bigger the number, the wins. The bigger the number wins. And um, yeah, so since z index of two is bigger than nothing, then yellow goes on top. Okay. I guess we can demonstrate a little bit then. Cool. Well, we're getting about out of time here, so it looks like I'm not going to get to my third layout. However, I do want to illustrate that we did a couple, we did probably the two trickiest ones on here. So in your time here, maybe this afternoon, if you really want to just finish up this participation 6A, um, we did a couple tricky ones here. Make sure you get those tricky ones done. If you wanted to, you could knock out one of these easier ones pretty easily, right? That's why they're called easy. Um, yeah, so you could easily do one of those simpler ones, or if you wanted to try one of the more complicated ones. In fact, this one here with the red block that's centered is probably going to be easier for you to do now that you understand how to center an element like that, especially center it horizontally in the space. So yeah, you can do this one, this little split. That's one layout. Then you could do another variation of that with the red block over it. That's another layout. So you'll see there's lots of similarities in these different layouts. It's not like it's 18 different ones. It's really what, five different ones with variations. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the other good thing we have going for us, by the way, is on our web page, we have this really cool nav menu here. And although you don't get any extra credit for right now, for making this drop down menu, um, there will be an extra credit assignment coming up soon. I have to figure out what I want us to do, but it's going to involve making a drop down menu. And if you want to tackle that one, this is going to be good practice for you. So if I click on layout number two, I'll go to my layout two. I'll go back. And if I click on my layout number one, it's going to go to my layout number one, and I'll go back. And there we go. So, and then if I want to put this in my website, I have to publish everything, of course, but then I just need to make sure that I have a link from my index home to my participation six home, which has the menu. And then I can click on that and then click on the links to go to the layout examples. So I'm basically using your menu to go find a page that has a menu, then then click on those links that'll take me to the layout examples. Oh, all right. That's a lot. This was a um, hopefully you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because I like making web pages and we tackled three web pages today with new and complicated components. So there's something I think of interest and a value in each of these three pages. And I know a couple of you have asked about those drop down menus. So hopefully that'll kind of stoke the fire to enhance those on your own pages. And if you can do these complicated layouts, then you're pretty much going to be able to do any layout you need to. So keep practicing that. I'm going to sign off and um, I'll talk to you later. If you have a quick question for me after class, I'll stick, stick around. <laughs> Otherwise, get in touch with me later and I'll be on later tonight as well. William, cool. I'll hang around for a bit. Thanks all. Hi, um, yeah. with the assignment that's due tonight, I keep running.
into a problem with one of the nav menus. Okay. Um, we have a couple options. Do you want to share your screen or is it already online that I can go look at? Uh, I could share my screen. Okay, let's do that. Let me uh, make you a co-host. Let's see, I need to stop sharing. Hold on. Um, so I'm actually using two PCs at the moment. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, got it. That's why I was signed in twice. So mm. I'm about to walk back into it. Well, do you want to describe your issue? Maybe I can get it from the description and... No, no. Not the best wordsmith, so... Yeah, okay. Let me uh, let me do this. Let me go and make you a co-host. Okay. I'll be the W.A. W Aspen. Here, let me do that. So you, so it is published, so I can find it that way? No, it isn't. Oh, W.A. Aspen is the one I need to make a code. Yeah, sorry. Me. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Um, more, make co-host, cool. Oh, hold on, let me turn off, I'm gonna turn off my recorder too. So, um, stop recording.